Good morning, friends. Uh, it is Orthodox or Eastern Good Friday today on the 58th day of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And we continue to be blown away by the fundamentally supernatural answers to prayer that are happening even in the midst of world events. Uh, for so long, most of us have felt that prayer was a matter of last resort and we're discovering it's the front lines. It's where real change happens. I've said this from the very beginning of the war that churches and pastors were saying, listen guys, the battle is spiritual first and foremost, even as they were in the midst of shelling. And so I, I wanna encourage you, if you've been in this fight from the beginning or you've just joined us, it is making a difference and it is essential if we're going to see the, the vulnerable protected, if we're going to see um, that, that um, freedom and the gospel to flourish in these areas. So thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you who have shared, liked, uh, getting the word out over and over again. We just, we're so grateful it is making a difference. And so as always, if we're gonna look at the dark areas, what do we gotta do first? We have to encourage ourselves in the Lord, strengthen ourselves in the Lord like David did in 1 Samuel 30. Uh, we have to enter his courts with thanksgiving, uh, enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. We're gonna celebrate the, the victories. We're gonna celebrate the um the very real testimonies of what you and I have been praying for. Some, if you were on with us yesterday, you guys remember, we were talking about the Wagner Group. The Wagner Group, they've been estimating anywhere between 10,000 and 20,000 of these Syrian and Libyan and Russian mercenaries. Uh, these are bad actors. One of the people who's actually left the Wagner Group reported they said 10 to 15% of these guys are just pure rank sociopaths, psychopaths. They love inflicting pain, they love killing. Like literally, they don't care who they kill. These are bad actors. And so we've been praying very specifically as they've been, tr they originally were trying to bring in 40,000, look like only 10 to 20,000. Well, now the number we're finding is only 8,000 have managed to make it to Donbass. And what we prayed yesterday, we prayed specifically that they'd be wiped out, they'd be neutralized before they could effectively engage in the battle. Well, at what we just got reports is 3,000 of that 8,000 are already dead, gone, out of the picture. Guys, prayer makes a difference. The enemy attempts to intimidate, to terrify, to overwhelm, and yet we pray from a place of hope and courage, and God brings divine solutions. So come on, man, there's been some huge um, successes across the front. Uh, Russia has... Um, they alternate. So the the second day, they shelled like crazy. The third day, they attempted, that was yesterday, attempted to move forward on multiple fronts. And almost every single time they did, they were fundamentally pushed back. Um, the Ukrainian army just, just today destroyed three tanks near Izum. Uh, they also, um, when they the Russian troops near Kherson attempted to move forward and they failed. They were pushed back. The, out of all those 10 attacks that were done on the ground yesterday in Donetsk and Lugansk, they were every single one was pushed back and six tanks, eight other armored vehicles, 15 cars and four artillery systems were destroyed. What? Guys, everybody was going, listen, it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. Why? Because Russia was literally mounting everything they had, 60,000 troops ready to move, pushing as hard as they could, getting ready because this is the last throw of the die. They've got to win by March, May uh, 9th. They've got to get a solid victory. And, and they're at this point, they want any victory. And the, even so, they keep getting pushed back. Praise God. Uh, one of the things that we've said from the beginning that Russia's goal was 
truly not just occupation, but to make it an integral part of the places that they take, an integral part of Russia, as evidenced by the fact they've turned each of these areas into a ruble zone. They're they're um, kidnapping any uh, government officials who refuse to receive them. Uh, they're deporting mass amounts of Ukrainians, what they did in Crimea, and then importing Russians kind of thing. They haven't imported the Russians yet. But the evidence of this is Russia's finally admitted that's their goal, uh, essentially. And uh, Zelensky was saying there's moves to create a uh, fake, uh, you know, uh, uh, vote that's showing that the people of the occupied territories want to be part of Russia. Well, um, even to the point where Russia's uh, like taking people's passport information uh, to to falsify the results. It's 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 nuts, uh, but it's all just a, a piece of uh, set theater. Anyway. Uh, the economy, Russia's economy has continued to inch to a, towards a default. Um, and, and as one of the key uh, sovereign, uh, the industry bodies that oversees credit has ruled that when Russia failed to pay last Monday their debts, that that essentially moved them toward a default. In other words, now I think we are 16 days from an official default. Uh, this is... This, this, is, this is catastrophic in terms of decades it will take for Russia to recover if there is not a fundamental change. Uh, this is creating such massive pressure inside of the Russian government and it's starting to show up on the ground in Russia because the, the elite, again, have only followed Putin based on what they can get. He's surrounded himself with thieves and the thieves are losing everything. There are some red lines that we're gonna cross uh, that, uh, that if we cross as far as them losing their stuff, where Putin is fundamentally in danger, if not for his life, definitely from being turned over to the Hague. So this is real. This is this economy. But another step of that is VTB, uh, VTB, the one of the main banks, uh, also is headed toward default, um, as they also have been unable to pay their debts. Uh, man, it just over and over and over again, it is it, it's nuts. Um, all right. Um, in Mariupol. So Russia is declaring that they have total victory in Mariupol. And I love how one uh, Ukrainian uh, broadcaster put it. He said, how can, if you, if the main fortress of a city is not taken, how can you say you've taken the city? And Avostal actually takes up almost a quarter of the entire uh, area of the city of Mariupol. And Russia is attempting to seal it off as Putin told Shoigu that not even a fly can escape. Well, the funny thing is, is it turns out they haven't even managed to fully take all the civilian areas. The um, They are attempting to say they've taken everything so civilians will surrender. They will allow themselves to be deported. Uh, they are not. And in fact, even yesterday, the, the uh, fighters out of Azovstal had some victories. Um, it said um, they managed to destroy three Russian tanks and two armored personnel carriers in the last two days. Guys, continue to pray for Mariupol. They continue to stand. There have been, I don't even know how this is possible. We've been praying that they would get through to them and resupply them. And there are reports they did that. I can't even imagine how they did it. It's uh, it's about 80 miles to the front from uh, the, with Mariupol to, uh, Aunt, to Mariupol. So I don't know how they could have done it. But listen, <laughs> miracles happen. Miracles happen. Um, continue to pray. Again, we've been praying that they would be able to break through to Mariupol, resupply them, and evacuate as much as possible. Um, Russia wants to claim that they've created this entire land bridge. It's just not happening. Um, so, um, oh no, <laughs> I totally forgot. I didn't even put this one in here. Um, is, um, as always, if you want these in print form, go to ariselife.org slash Ukraine. Anyway, um, this is awesome. Okay. So Putin yesterday, we talked about this, declared that they were going to block off Mariupol. They were not going to attempt to take Mariupol. That was a huge answer to prayer because they were just continued to, to kill, destroy. And they're just like, we're just going to block them off and starve them out. And that was actually an answer to prayer. But here's the thing we didn't understand. 30 minutes before Putin made that statement, 
um, Kadyrov had said, so the military types were saying it will take a couple days to be able, or, or four days. I think Shorigo said, if we do an all out attack, it will take four days to take Azovstal. Well, Kadyrov, you guys remember, he's the Chechen warlord. He is the worst of the hawks. He has making a play for increased, increased influence. He's all but called Putin a coward. And uh, he is an evil actor. He's got 2,000 troops in Moscow. There are almost no troops in Moscow except his. So he's a real threat. Well, he said, forget four days. You, I could do it in a half a day. 30 minutes later, Putin said, we're just going to seal it off. Now, what is that saying? There's a couple of things. One is it's attempt to say, I'm in charge, buddy, not you. But I think it's also he's trying to call Kadira's bluff. He's like, okay, if you can do it, go ahead. What, are you going to do it? Are you going to do it? So that if Kadirov attempts to take it, first of all, he'll be unsuccessful. And second of all, he, the, I believe that it would be an opportunity for Putin to assassinate Kadyrov. Um, we've said this before, let the snake turn on itself and it's happening. It, overt infighting. Praise God. Continue to pray for that. All right. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Oh, the UN, high the High Commissioner for Human Rights, has accused Russia of taking action in Ukraine that may amount to war crimes. That's the most clear statement anybody in the UN has made about that. That's huge. Now, you got to understand the UN is not a monolith. Um, within it, there are different factions, even within the organizational structure uh, beyond the member countries. And so that's huge. Um, but, um, and, and we've mentioned that the, uh, the head of the UN has also uh, been calling for a ceasefire, right, over Easter. And Ukraine has said, we would love that. Let's do that. And in fact, the EU, the European Council President Charles Michel called Putin today and joined in calling for that ceasefire. So everybody's like, do a ceasefire. It's revealing that the problem is on Russia's end. Why is that important? Because India and China keep pushing this narrative of, we got to have a ceasefire, got to have a ceasefire, when it's fundamentally obvious that Russia is un. Be unbelievably unwilling to participate in any ceasefire that doesn't allow them to win. And so guys, this is, this is awesome. We've got to keep revealing the brokenness of the narrative because even today there've been new reports because they are blaming uh, existing problems on the war. So there's been a three year drought in Somalia. There is a horrible famine happening there. Now they're blaming that on Ukraine. Why? So that they can make it, that they can force a ceasefire for economic reasons. And uh, guys, nah, -uh, mm -mm. this continues to force the truth. Praise God. Also, we mentioned that Ru that Ukraine had fulfilled their questionnaire, their application for membership to the EU. Well, Moldova has done the same. This is a huge shift um, because um, in 2008, Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia all uh, begged to be part of the EU and part of NATO, and they were refused. Um, they were doing that because Russia was invading Georgia and was intimating what was going to happen, you know, today, 14 years later. And so this is huge that they have been, they've accepted their application, right? You know, so let's just see where this rolls. Let's pray for that. Okay, so if you're encouraged of all the things that are happening, now we got to turn and look at what needs to happen, okay? Shelling. Okay, so I, I, I told you about this alternate. Shell, invade, shell, invade. Well, this is a day of shelling. They are shelling all across the this. Uh, oh, and I got a map for you. If you go to arisealife.org slash Ukraine, you'll see this in the update. Um, but if you look, I have to flip these backwards so they're visible to you. But anyway, um, so if you look, this red area is the area that Russia controls right now, right? That's part of Ukraine. And they're going to be attacking from many, many different, different directions. We'll talk about that in a second. But you see all throughout along that, there have been shelling uh, coming, uh, massive amounts of shelling. Maybe I can get closer for you. Ooh, ooh hey, there you go. And uh, there we go. Okay, uh-huh, all right. There we go. All right, so um, there's been massive amounts of shelling. And this is, uh, but most of it is doing little uh, to no, having little to no effect on the entrenched, uh, uh, well-protected defensive positions of Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and so the shelling is, they want to soften up the defenses and then be able to attack. Now, here's where the problem is. 
The Ukrainians have been responding with massive artillery attacks, and that's awesome, except they have been going through their shells. They are running out of Soviet era 152 millimeter shells. The new standard, the NATO standard is 155 millimeters. It's horrible. For three millimeters difference, we've got a problem. And so the 152 millimeter things, so they're using less and less. Before, anytime Russians move, the reasons why Russia hasn't been able to move in 60 days or 58 days is because every time they moved, U Ukrainian artillery is the world's best right now. They are nailing them left, right, and center, and they're just unable to move. And so... What's happening is they are, um, but now they're running out. And as they're running out, they're shelling less. The Russians are able to move a bit more. And now they have to use, um, I'll move for in a second, Ruth. Um, I, what they're going to do is they're going to, um, uh, they're going to be able to uh, attack. Uh, as they attack, the Ukrainians are forced to use tanks and infantry. That exposes more loss of life on the Ukrainian side, but also it makes it messier and it gives more opportunities for the Russians to move forward as they did at Kremlina. So um, what I'm going to talk about in a second is specifically with that map, I'm going to show you what they're going to do and how to pray. So what I want to ask you about is what I want you guys to do, I've said this before and I'll say it again, there's going to be a bunch of things I'm going to tell you. You ask God to impress on your heart what to pray for, okay? Pray for those those things. Um, and uh, oh gosh, um, before we get into that, I have to give praise. Man, the church again is on the move. God is moving. The church is rising up. I, I do hope there is full documentation of all that the churches throughout Ukraine are doing, that people are coming to know the Lord. But in the middle of it, they're rising up and they're going straight in into the hardest areas. Um, our friends, Vladimir and Lilia, through your gifts and our gifts, we have been able to send over, we're sending over another 4,000 today. That will bring the total to well over $97,000. We've been able to send in the last three or four weeks. And what that means is right now, in the city of Dnipro, where they are, they are completely out of everything except like aspirin. Well, guess what? They are, they are with these monies going and, and finding med these absolutely needed medicines. They're getting wish lists from the local hospitals and they are going to Kiev and further west and finding these medicines that are becoming increasingly scarce and expensive and they're purchasing them and bringing them and keeping the hospitals going. These are things like insulin. These are things that people can't live without. We will never know the number of lives that have been saved through your gifts um, and through what they are doing. Praise God. They're continuing to serve. They're continuing to, to get the wounded out, get refugees out, um, you know, serve refugees. Praise God. Continue to pray for them as they are tired, as they are continuing to go on their 58th day, two months of just nonstop, but they continue with joy to do this. So praise God. All right. So now let me show you what's happening and and again, ask God to show you what to pray for. All right, so what we've got here is, <clears throat> let me just start. There's six main targets in the Russian offensive. And the first is Kharkov in the north. Kharkov is um, it's a city of a million people. 70% of the people are still there, in, in, unbelievably, considering the amount of bombing. Only Mariupol has suffered more attack than, <clears throat> than Kharkov. They continue to shell incessantly, but they have pulled back. They, the Ukrainians have forced, uh, kind of opened the vice that was around uh, Kharkov, and, but they are bombing it. And, and it's hard to understand what their intention is apart from just to destroy, just to destroy and eventually take. But in the middle of that, you see this blue line. What has happened is the Ukrainians have pushed through for a couple of reasons. They, you see that big, long red line coming down. That is the supply route to the city of Izum. And they are attempting to threaten it. And that's forcing uh, Russians to divert battalions from Izum uh, to there, but also from Kharkov in order to defend it. But also if they break through and cut the supply line, that would be amazing. So it's a, it's a really decisive move by the Ukrainians. Um, but as you see, they're coming down to the second city, which is Izum. Izum is, uh, they've pushed through um, to get an open door into the heartland of Ukraine with Izum. And they are now turning and they're, they're sending two different forces out. One towards the west 
uh, to try to meet up with the groups coming from Zaporozhye, try to make a huge encirclement. But then another portion, they're going towards Slavyansk and Kramatorsk. And with the idea of encircling this whole region. And so they're joining up with this. That's number three is Kramatorsk and Slavyansk. And the two areas where Russia has made any inroads at all in the last, since April 1st, is uh, with the city of the town of Papasna, uh, Kremina and um, Papasna. But they haven't even managed to take Papasna. They're, they've lost about half of what they had actually already taken uh, in that area of Papasna as, as the Ukrainian army pushes back. Um, so but again, they're just trying to encircle either like that or like that and take whole sections at a time and it's not working, but they, they are continuing to push. One of the biggest signs that Izum is their number one staging is there are 60,000 troops prepared to, for this invasion and uh, throughout this whole region, 15,000 of them are in Izum. 22 out of, I believe, 86 battalions are in Izum and they are preparing, they're trying to get them to roll and so pray, pray that they get blocked. Um, down here, Mariupol, we've talked about that. Pray that, they're, that they get through to them. Pray that they are able to break through. They're able to um, uh, get uh, in supplies, uh, resupply them and get people out. Again, there is upwards of 100,000 civilians still in there, even though Russia continues to deport as many as they can find and catch, um, And but the people are holding out. Um, another area, we didn't talk about this, Melitopol, they are, there is continued uprising. They, listen, this is, don't ever buy any lie of the enemy uh, or of Russia that, that this is peaceful because the people of Melitopol absolutely do not want the Russians there and they're continuing to fight back uh, in, in, uh, in peaceful protest and not peaceful sabotage. So pray, pray for them there. Um, in Kherson, uh, the, the last spot, oh no, no, Zaporozhye. So what right now is relatively, I mean, they're shelling like crazy, but there's no, there hasn't been much movement except in Guliane Polia there in Zaporozhye. But the goal there is to move toward the city of Zaporozhye. It's a city of about a million people, uh, 750,000, sorry. And it is, it sits atop one of the largest hydroelectric dams in Europe uh, that the Soviets blew up in World War II and caused unbelievable loss of life. We've said this before. This is, um, this is a possible, this is a pot. There's so much wrong with this, but it also provides a massive amount of electricity to the, to, to, uh, to Ukraine. So as, um, uh, I want to say something like, I forget how much, but anyway, a lot of the electricity comes from that hydroelectric dam. Um, and um, so they are heading for that. That is, and the goal is to completely encircle that section of the Dnieper, which has uh, been blocked up called the Zaporozhye Reservoir. And so, so that we're, that's preparing. They've made no real inroads in that whole section in weeks. They're, they have a lot on the line there to push forward. Pray that doesn't happen. Now over here, um, and uh, you've got Kherson. In Kherson, they are they are staging to try for two different things. One is they've been trying to come up the other side of the Zaporozhye um, res reservoir and head towards Kriviri. Uh, that's actually the hometown of uh, Zelensky, but also it puts him in the path of some more nuclear reactors. They've been trying to take over the Euro the the uh, Ukrainian electrical grid. Uh, and uh, went like they did when they took Ener Hadar. Um, that's another key reactor. But over here in Kherson, they are continuing not to make any headway. Actually, they're losing ground, but they are pushing as hard as they can because their number one goal is is beyond creating the land bridge through Mariupol, is to push through from to Mikolaiva and from Mikolaiva to Odessa and then from Odessa to take the the area, uh, the quote unquote break area, breakaway area of Transnistra and Moldova uh, that they also claim are part of Russia. Uh, they're claiming everything. Uh, listen, uh, if you, 
Putin is very overt about the fact that he holds to the beliefs of a philosopher by the name of Dugin. Dugin actually believes that Russia's goal and role is to control all of Europe. So guys, this is, doesn't end here. <laughs> it doesn't end here. There's no way to satisfy the beast, give him a little something to make him stop. This has to end in the field. Again, we're praying that the Russians move and they are cut off. Or again, pray for the rain to fall so that... Um, so that they uh, they get stuck, pray they they roll out, pray that um, oh, fuel doesn't get through, pray against logistics, pray for the the weak, pray for those who've been trapped again because the the Ukrainians have held all these back. Uh, the people who are still in those regions have been relatively safe, even though the shelling is continuing. Praise God. Continue to pray for wisdom for uh, people of when to flee and where to flee protection while they flee. Uh, pray for the church to arise. There's so much going on. But again, it's not enough to just simply pray against the plans of the enemy. We have to pray for the plans of God. And what are God's plans? Many of you have reached out and said, hey, is this the Gog-Magog war in, uh, in, in the Bible? Uh, I say no. And I could give you a long biblical reason why that's not the case. Let me simply say this. We know the plans God has for Ukraine. We know the plans he has for Russia and Belarus, and it's not to be oppressed. It is not to be uh, uh, this this uh, this um, method, uh, this means of oppression. No, the goal, God's best for Ukraine is to be the fl the the spark, the flame that sets Russia on fire, so that all Russia, Belarus, and the so former Soviet Union would be set aflame with the gospel, and all the world would come to the fire. <laughs> That's the best. That's what we're leaning into. We've we've been in the region, as I said, for 20, 30 years. We we know we under we know the people. We've been praying into this, and what's happening happening is for is that God it, God there is a fire inside of Ukraine that is igniting listen it's in the darkest times that the light shines the brightest it, it when when everybody is running in fear and panic and the church rises up in courage hope and love Wow. So continue to pray against that rage that is so natural among the Ukrainian people, but rather that they would respond to the Russians in love and that those Russian soldiers who are, who surrender or who, uh, who are captured would be, they would receive the gospel. They'd be delivered from the traumas of what's been done to them by the Russian government and what they've been forced to do or what they willingly participated in. They would be set free from the bondage of sin and death and they would be set aflame with the gospel and go back as missionaries into the harvest fields of Russia. The, again, pray for Russia, um, Russia to come to its senses and fall on its knees, not just for what's happening now, but for the entire Soviet Union. Listen, pray. The, the, that has never truly been a, uh, a recognized the horrors that were done in the name of communism in the Soviet Union. They still don't really understand what happened. And pray for massive repentance across Russia that all that, that the gospel would flood in and they would take their place in the harvest to be one of the greatest missionary sending countries the world has ever seen. Guys, this is the time. We've got to be encouraged. We've got to be full of Hope. But listen, if you're sitting there and you're going, man, I am not full of hope. I'm full of fear. I'm full of confusion. I'm full of terror. Listen, God loves you too. You matter. Even if you're not hiding in a bunker, he loves you and he has more than enough attention and love to pour out on you. And so wherever you are right now, I bless you with the peace of God, that his hope and joy would so wrap up your heart that you would be overwhelmed with life and peace, that you would know that you matter and that he would be pouring out wisdom and insight and hope to pray into the areas where you're struggling, the areas you need breakthrough. Guys, we have an amazing team on here. Um, when we get on at this time, hey, there's Gary. Come on. Hey, listen, Gary is one of our team. He heads up our men's mentoring groups. If you'd like to be a part of one of those groups, just say men's group. We also have uh, Mariana Sikowska and Jill Hawes head up our women's groups. These are online on Zoom. Um, if you're interested in those, type women's group. And just, what they'll do is they'll reach out to you and give you the, the details of how to connect to those. Um, but also, if you need prayer for anything, just simply say, need prayer. And they love to come alongside of you and, and pray for you. They'll ask you, what do you need prayer for? And they'll pray for you by text. 
Uh, many times people say, how is that even effective? <laughs> Listen, you read your Bible, that's a message in text. Guys, the word of God is powerful no matter what form it comes. And uh, uh, we have so many testimonies from y'all of what he's doing through these prayers. Ah, well, listen, guys, we love you. Hey, as always, if you'd like to be a part, like I said, we're sending over $4,000 today. Again, prices are climbing in the middle of Ukraine, in the middle of the invasion, prices for gas, prices uh, for medicines, even prices for needed foodstuffs. Uh, your gifts matter. So if you want to give, go to riselife.org slash help Ukraine for more information. There's a button there to give. Uh, and all 100% of that money goes straight to Ukraine as quickly as we can get it. Um, uh, and uh, you are making a massive difference there. Uh, there. Again, there's more information on what's happening about the church, Blagavist, and uh, Good News, and Vladimir and Lilia there. Uh, you can fo also see their Facebook pages so you can see photos and videos in real time. Uh, of what's happening and being a part of that. And uh, the great thing is Facebook translates their text, so um, it's good. But love you all so much. So incredibly grateful for you. Oh, one last thing. Some of you have been concerned because we were our, our website was hacked that, that maybe the giving is not secure. It's 100% secure. Uh, it's actually run through a totally separate site. So that's why it's gonna take you to a churchcenter.com site that's run, that, that runs the processing through Stripe totally secure. Uh, none of your information uh, gets lost. So that's, um, uh, yeah, ariselife.churchcenter.com slash give, and that will take you there as well. Just make sure you select Ukraine Relief Fund, not general fund, and all those monies will get there. Well, we love you guys. We're so grateful for you all. Continue to share, continue to like, continue to comment. Let Continue to comment on other people's comments. Uh, continue to write in what you're praying for. Man, these feeds, if you've been on these before, these, uh, these, um, these uh, these uh, feeds stay live easily 24 hours. They're hot where you guys are responding to each other and we love it. We love it. Pray for each other. You see someone saying need prayer, ask them what they need prayer for. Don't, don't wait on our team. You guys are, you guys, we bless you guys to pray for each other too. So have an amazing day. Be blessed. Take care.